Welcome to the Real Chili Podcast. And the Golden Eagles of Marquette University in Milwaukee are bound for the Final Four for only the third time ever. Five seconds left. Marquette down by one. Trying to avoid the upset. Blew the drive. The left hand. It's good. Every day, as basketball players, as students, and I want to win every day, most importantly, as people. Good morning, afternoon, evening, ladies and gentlemen, fans of Marquette, and all of you Marquette and Purdue fans that just watched that basketball game are as confused as Eric Trump watching the impeachment proceedings. hey Oh and also, God. doesn't Donald Trump Jr.'s beard look like it was made if Matt Painter's hair was put onto a cheese grater and then glued to his face? <laughs> that's the only way to describe that. And I think only, that that's what that beard is, yeah. And the only way to describe Marquette's 65-55 victory over Purdue was unbelievable. Um, this is the Real Chili Podcast. You may have notice that this is not either of your normal hosts. I don't have the exuberance of a Brian Henry or the um, sharp seriousness and focus. Of, say, of, the, the calm procedural antics. There you go. Of a, of a Scott Michael Lavender, but, <laughs> but you might be a little, it might be a little more zany tonight as uh, Pete Worth, neighbor Worth uh, is your host. I'm joined by my fellow Pete, my fellow Peter, Peter Mohan. What are your thoughts on tonight's crazy turnaround of events? Yeah, I just, I think that this really hammers home the point that Wojo can't make halftime adjustments. (laughs) (laughs) Are you guys kidding me? A 40 to 17 second half, I believe. Is that what it was? Yeah, uh, that's, that's what it was. I'm not looking 40, at the box score, but that's what it was. 40 to 17, Marquette outscored Purdue after being down by 18 at one point in the game. And we were just talking uh, before we went on the pod and had said that this is basically the narrative in zero of Marquette's in game sequences that we've ever seen. Th- this is not how it goes when you go down 18. To a Big Ten team in a Gavit game, and pretty much this team flipped the script and took a lot of grit to get there. Yeah, usually we're saying "Dad Gavit" every time uh, we play in one of these things, which is a really terrible joke. But um, uh, we've always played really terribly in those games, and it sure looked like we were going to do the same thing uh, as this first half progressed. We looked overmatched in all facets of the game in the first half except for maybe the free throw line. Purdue couldn't make it anything all night from the, from the charity stripe. But they were moving the ball better. They were shooting better. They were out-rebounding us by quite a bit, getting to the loose balls. And we were bricking everything. And I was like, we're going to lose this game by 30. And I'm sure most of Marquette's fan base thought that as well. And then <laughs> I thought the key to change in the game in the second half right off the bat um, Hauser's defense. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, Joey Joey Hauser not being in the game. No, um, you might agree with me. I thought it was, and Stephen Bardo kind of alluded to this too, which is what I was thinking was Kobe McEwen being aggressive on the offensive end. Well, yeah, and this is kind of something that we've talked about in the preview pods and uh, speculating on what Kobe's game might look like in the Marquette gold and blue. But eight out of nine from the free throw stripe, Um, And just having that aggressiveness and assertiveness to get into the paint and look confident finishing near the rim. Um, It's something excellent to have, to have that confident large guard, to be able to take it to the rack in crunch time and also hit the free throws that you need to seal a game. Um, It's, I think that he really makes a perfect compliment to Marcus Howard in the backcourt and, uh, I mean, Sakar too, a, a key member of the backcourt. He was only two for eight from the field today, but 
he's a glue guy. He's, he makes plays when he has to. He's always on the floor after the loose balls. And I, I really like the way that this backcourt is shaping up overall. And the team defense in general just seems totally improved. I am um, completely – if I – if I had heard you say that at halftime, I would have been like, what the fuck are you talking about? You were <laughs> the same person. Because Kobe literally did nothing, nothing in the first half. I was like, will you do something? You're the main point guard and you're not even like, you're not contributing in any sense of the word. Or mm-hmm. like there was no facet of the game outside of maybe he was staying in front of his man defensively. He wasn't causing any steals or anything. But he was bringing the ball off the court, passing it, and, and that was it. And I was like, what? Is this really what we're going to get from this guy against like Stella? Yeah, Chartoony play. It was yeah. Chartoony. Well, well we try not to chart as much, try not to chart <laughs> this year uh, as much as possible. Um, but yeah, exactly. That's kind of what it reminded, reminded me of. But well, I think uh, he had six points in the first half and then 17 in the second half to end up leading all scorers with 23. Um, another interesting development I thought in the backcourt correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like Greg Elliott got some opportunities to handle the rock a little bit. Uh, he ended up with four assists to two, to two turnovers, only three points in the game, but he seemed to be um, relied upon active. quite a bit off the bench by Wojo, and we didn't really see Samir Torrance at all. Uh, he, he did have one rebound registered, uh, but other than that, pretty much non-existent oh, from, yeah. when from the freshman. Him. He got in for those last 30 seconds when Wojo, yeah. Wojo shocked the Purdue defense or Purdue uh, offense with a 2-3 with a zone, giving up <laughs> two unbelievably <laughs> wide-open three-pointers that I can't believe neither of them went in. Um, but luckily, it was a brilliant strategy. Yeah, luckily we can kind of laugh at that uh, at, at, the time, at the time being. So I think that we talked a little bit about Kobe. I thought – that drive that he had where he kind of started at the top of the key and went all the way into the paint um, and finished that layup was kind of the mojo that, that got Marquette feeling it a little bit and, mm-hmm. and believing that they could come back. And then he hit a pretty tough corner three. And I still, even when that was happening, I was like, okay, that's fine. But like Purdue is moving the ball really, really well in the first half. They're moving it through harms. Harms was pretty much doing whatever he wanted when he got the ball. And I still, it, it took me until I think maybe Marcus hit a shot to, to put us like within four, or maybe it was a Sakar three. I don't remember exactly which, which basket was, but when we got, when we were up by seven and cut it to four, I was like, okay, I guess we, we might be able to do it. We're getting enough stops, um, which we weren't doing in the first half, but yeah, I it's still, I don't understand how kind of Purdue, changed so dramatically i think i mean we definitely tightened the screws on them on defense a little bit um yeah it wasn't necessarily any impressive interior defense or anything but it seemed like we were playing their pick and rolls well um you know taking tight routes around screens and things like that i I think that that has been a bit of a theme over the first two games that i've noticed just guys maybe taking a more aggressive line getting around those screens Uh, pick and roll defense is obviously something that we needed to improve on over last year. So I I like seeing that activity on defense, but uh, just getting out there and getting rebounds. I mean, uh, Purdue known for being a pretty strong physical team, good rebounders. And uh, you know, they only out rebounded us by one in this game. So I think to hang in there and, and just the fact, if you told me that Marcus, and Brendan Bailey would combine for 18 points and we would win this game by 10. I'd think that you're crazy. Uh, the fact that we're, we're sitting here talking about a game, uh, really a huge win for the resume early in the season, for and sure. really none of it, I mean, very little of it was dependent on Marcus Howard. I mean, obviously he d- did hit some key shots at some key times. Overall, fairly efficient still, 6 out of 12, 3 out of 7 from 3. But uh, we certainly didn't rely on him as much as we relied on Kobe's steady hand and willingness to, to drive the ball late in the game. 
Right. And we're going to need that on a very, very consistent basis from, from Kobe, I think, because Jamal, Greg, and Brendan, we have, we kind of see it. I, I don't have any confidence that they're going to be able to step up into that, you know, reliable eight to 10 points a game kind of guy. And so, mm-hmm. it, and that's just because I think they're not good enough ball handlers you know, we still see too many turnovers from those guys. And when they do kind of take the ball to the rim, they seem a little timid mm-hmm. and they'll, they'll get stripped and they kind of, they do settle for three sometimes. Uh, I was a little, I was very disappointed in Sakar's game in the first half. He was settling a little bit and not being as aggressive as, as I thought, you know, an experienced senior in a big game should be. He definitely turned that around in the second half. Maybe the, when he got conked in the head, kind of uh, turned him around a little bit. But mm-hmm. um, you were talking about the interior defense, and I thought this wasn't the most flashy game from Theo John, but I thought it was one of his most underrated performances because dealing with harms, I know you said that he's the most overrated uh, praying mantis that you've ever seen. <laughs> I, uh, sure. I agree with the praying mantis part, but he is pretty good. And he, he was, oh, yeah. uh, I mean, the way he was passing out of double teams um, was, was, was pretty impressive. And like anytime he got the ball, good things happened for for Purdue until like everything was going to shit and Marquette kind of got the lead and started to take over. But Theo John was always in good position uh, for defensive rebounds, especially um, Mm -hmm. and, and played tough D and when uh, other Purdue players got in the paint, he was a presence. He don't know if he even really blocked his shot. He might've, might've had one or two. Yeah. Uh, He he had one. one. Just had one, um, but but nine rebounds. But nine yeah. rebounds, yeah. I mean, it was a it was a really great. I thought, um, y- you know, well, you won't get the headlines in this game for sure. Kobe will and Marcus will a little bit, but I thought it was great, great job by Theo. And I mean, I, I was saying to to Pete earlier that I wasn't hugely impressed by this Purdue squad, and they had just come off a loss to Texas as well, but. Um, Ken Palm still likes them. I mean, even after this loss, uh, stats updated, they still see Purdue as the number nine team in the country, which talk about resume building. If you beat a top 10 team, doesn't matter if you're at home or on the road, that's a huge win. So I think the story of the game is this team made adjustments and also they really seem to get into their game plan well in the second half. Um, the, the, the team that we saw in the second half was a little bit more like what we expected to see. Obviously we looked really good because we were, we outscored the team by 23 points in the half, but, um, relying on good ball handling, driving to the basket, clutch shots from Marcus when we needed them and just solid D team defense all around. I think that's the recipe for success for this team. I don't, you know, we don't have the sharp shooters that we did last year necessarily, but we have seems like more hustle, seems like better defense, and just a little bit overall more solid guard play in in various facets. I think that that's going to go a long way for this team. Yeah, for sure. The element of, of a guy like Kobe McEwen is something that was sorely missed uh, last year, a guy who was able to penetrate the defense can shoot it and can handle the ball and be your primary uh, ball handler if necessary. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, he's a, he's a huge key to this season. And I, you know, going back to Marcus, um, it's weird that we kind of aren't, um, it's been three years since we are talking about a game that like Marcus or Sam Hauser wasn't like the starring offensive player, you know, it kind of feels mm-hmm. like talking about somebody else. Yeah. Uh, but Marcus, just his presence alone and his shiftiness got uh, no gel Eastern produced probably their best player. I mean, he's not like a special talent by any means, but I think he's probably their best defender and their best all around player. Pretty versatile guy can do a little bit of everything and him getting three fouls early, I think was huge. And then the rest of Stefanovic uh, and then Wheeler who ended up fouling out Wheeler probably played the best Mm -hmm. uh, uh, game for Purdue tonight with the kind of the most all around box score. Um, But just us getting, being able to get those guys into early foul trouble. I kind of think, 
threw them off their game a little bit, even though they were up by 13 and a half. Like it, it still didn't seem like they kind of were firing on all cylinders just because of that. And then that really affected um, Purdue later in the game as, uh, you know, Wheeler fouled out, you know, Joe Eastern got another, you know, his fourth foul. I think he being kind of the leader of the team, having to be a little more tentative was uh, a major factor in the game. And I think you can contribute that to, to just the, the, Marcus is, Marcus Howard's ability to be the focal point of every defense and and not only just the guy guarding him but the entire opposing team. Well, I think that is something that I still think this offense can evolve on. Um, it seems like when Marcus has had success scoring the ball or Kobe has had success scoring the ball, they're fairly independent of each other. And it seems like we could still do a better job of using Marcus either as a decoy to get Kobe more open looks or vice versa. Um, and I think that obviously that'll come with time with those guys playing together longer, that chemistry kind of builds, but mm -hmm. certainly as they both individually develop into their own specific threat, um, obviously Marcus has a pretty defined threat threatening skill set by now, but if Kobe continues to establish his prowess going to the rack, uh, I think that that sets up a nice inside outside dichotomy that you have in, in the backcourt scoring um, opportunities. And that just makes this team harder to guard. So it's up to Wojo and the staff to figure out the best ways to capitalize on that and the best way to set those guys up for easy buckets. Yeah, for sure. Because uh, as we've talked about a lot, uh, just in the last 20 minutes, you know, Marcus has, hasn't really had that guy. I, I would like to see m kind of more, more cutting, more spacing, more, more ball movement um, than what I saw tonight. Um, you know, a lot of the times it's either Kobe starting it out, kicking it to a wing, and then we get a, um, a, a ball screen at the top of the key, and then everybody kind of either stands around or uh, there's still a lot of confusion and timidity. Uh, timidity tim yeah timidity yeah uh, i thought that was the right word um from from a lot of our guys and uh i think we sometimes call and fall in the trap until you know just w wait until marcus does something and i think that can be uh nullified a little bit if just everybody kind of keeps on slashing keeps on cutting keeps on moving and then the ball will continue to move and then that just gets us more open looks so there seem to be a lot of additional opportunities that we missed in the second half too, even, even with how well we played a lot of uh, second chance um, long misses on threes or good offensive rebounds that we grabbed off of misses and kicked out to open shooters who missed those uh, in the scramble situations. And I expect that we will start to make a few more of those um, wide open three point shots as the season goes along. And remember this team hadn't played in eight days bit of a layoff as well so maybe something there too but um i think those shots are bound to drop and i don't think you you can expect this team to shoot 28 percent from three every game going out from here that's for sure yeah and i wouldn't expect purdue to shoot 20 percent from the field like they did in the second half <laughs> i mean our no, defense but, we get a, but holy shit they could not make anything in the second half five of 25 from the field five freaking field goals in the second half and they couldn't make a damn free throw all night. So, I mean, and a lot of those were pretty good looks. So like our defense was pretty good, especially in the interior. Um, Bit of luck when it wasn't side. harms, but yeah, luck on both sides. For sure. I think that um, two things uh, about this weekend's matchup with Wisconsin. Yeah. One, um, getting this win is a huge monkey off the back of the team. Anytime you get that, first resume building win in the non-conference is huge. So you don't have to go into big East conference play like, Oh, well hope Nova ends up being a good win and that we can beat them kind of thing. Um, so to get that, I think really takes a lot of pressure off the guys uh, heading into Madison on Sunday. Um, and secondly, this serves as another opportunity to validate really how far our defense has come. Um, Obviously, 
looking at the first two performances, I think that it probably is the best defense that we've seen out of a Wojo squad thus far. And um, the Sunday, a chance to prove it. Uh, are we that legitimate defense? Can we um, put the vice grip on Wisconsin's offense? Or was it um, a fluke thing and Purdue is missing shots and this is just uh, same old Golden Eagles defense? So I'm looking forward to – seeing the climactic answer to that question on Sunday. Absolutely. As will Marquette Nation, everybody's going to be a little more excited for that game. Uh, Why? Than if they, than if they were, uh, if the second half had gone much like the first half in tonight's game. Is so, it red a horrific color? It is. It's, uh, you're supposed to hate it this week, That right? That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to hate red. We're supposed to dis- disregard any red, sto- uh, red traffic and disembowel lights. any badgers that we come across. Right. If you see a badger, slash it, uh, kill it. Turn it to a pelt. Yep. Uh, yeah, disregard any, pelt. disregard any red traffic lights. Just go uh, stop That's signs. It. Yeah, don't, don't, don't pay the, those any. When you any see badgers. the gold, speed up. That's right. Yep. Market gold. You don't want to see that red. Yep, that's exactly right. That's Florida uh, on gold. <laughs> all right, so that will do it here for this version of the Real Chili Podcast. Uh, except for one last quick segment. Pete, you got anything for the junk drawer? Open it up, baby. What do you got? I'll give you one. Go Marquette's ahead. first ever win against Purdue Boilermakers happened this very evening. Uh, our first win in nine opportunities from our folks from West Lafayette, Indiana, and also Marquette's first win in the, in the Gavit games. So two big check marks crossed tonight. Those are some pretty good check marks. Uh, I really like getting the monkey off the back uh, with reference to Purdue. Having lost to them eight times without a victory is simply inexcusable. And speaking as a person who had a monkey literally on their back on my honeymoon uh, not too long ago, it's not that bad. But figuratively, it's much worse than literally. I can tell you that for sure. <laughs> uh, I really, I, man, I, I don't really have a ton for the drunk drawer. I will say, though, um, here, here's my pitch. I have uh, found, and we were just talking about MU Scoop in our little text chain a little bit. Um, just how adorable it is at times. Um, (laughs) But one of the best things that you can find on there, there's a little wiki page on the side and in there is the recipe to make your own real chili at home. Oh, and I have done it before. Uh, I followed the one that seemed to be the consensus on the chain. There was maybe like nine posts on the chain guys offered kind of their little tweaks to it. Um, But Mark, I assume. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But people, you, there's little tweaks to the recipe and stuff that people are like, oh, you need to add this. Um, the one that uh, suggests you add a little bit of dark chocolate, that's the right one. Ooh. And I actually have one of those. Have you ever seen at, um, like, you know, CVS or something, they, they got the uh, lint chocolate bars, the chili uh, chili pepper chocolate. Have you had that? Uh, I don't think you so. You don't do that spicy stuff, really. Oh, right? I do. I do, oh, yeah. I, I, I dabble. Well, there's yeah. like a chili pepper um, flavored dark chocolate that you can buy. So okay. I crumble up a little, a couple of those uh, blocks in there, add that extra element, and I, I, I swear that stuff turned out real good. You don't want to necessarily be like, "Is this exactly real chili?" Because if you if you just eat it, the whatever that recipe is, it turns out great. So I recommend you, Marquette fans, go on to Emmy Scoop or or try and Google that real chili recipe and make it at home for good karma heading to this game against Wisconsin bowl of real chili never hurt. Plus we got, it seems like pretty much everyone in the listen listenerships getting hit by the polar vortex at the moment. So um, yeah, there's no better way to beat that than a bowl of real chili. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong at all. I I got a one quick question for you. So when you're making real chili, a real chili recipe at home, do you throw oyster crackers at your fiance? Just, like from across the kitchen table, uh, just like, well, this is how it's done. You got to do it. Yep. And then, um, but then I have to pick them up. (laughs) 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 Oh, that's the unfortunate thing about adulthood. Post post Marquette university, picking up your oyster. (laughs) Pick up that shit. 
All right. Well, that will do it for us on this episode of the Real Chili Podcast. We will be coming to you, I be- I'm sure, shortly after the Marquette Wisconsin game that happens this Sunday at noon in Madison. We will talk to you then. Ring one out. Brian Butch is a shot blocker.